is intended as a review supplement for my students here in uh, the pharmaceutical biochemistry subject at UST. And uh, this is for the finals. The assumptions are going to be as follows. One, you, you should know the basics of metabolism. I will not discuss here the introduction, why the need for metabolism, uh, the metabolic map, and so on. But uh, maybe I could just uh, mention some things that you should always keep in mind while uh, scanning through the pathways. Well, uh, you should know the difference between catabolism and anabolism. Uh, other than the fact that catabolism is breakdown and anabolism is building up, you should also be familiar of how to interpret a name in case you are unfamiliar with it. Which, by the way, you should not be unfamiliar with the pathways here because we are, well, the assumption is we discussed all of this. Like, for example, if I have, uh, let's say I have a pathway that uh, ends in the word lysis, like glycolysis or lipolysis or glycogenolysis, then obviously that means you're breaking down something. Or for anabolism, if you have genesis as a suffix, then most likely it is a building up process, like glycogenesis, lipogenesis, and so on. The need for irreversible steps because if you have uh, discussed this in your introduction, you should know that if there is no irreversible step in a pathway, then the pathway is called futile. No? It's useless. Okay? So in order to have some kind of direction, you should have at least one irreversible step. And uh, next, the rate limiting step is a step in a pathway that determines how fast the entire pathway would be. If the rate limiting step enzyme is activated, then expect the pathway to be fast. But if the rate limiting step is kind of stopped by some reason, then the pathway will slow down. You should have encountered these already before. Like for example, if you've never heard of urea cycle during class, I don't know, there are a lot of probable re reasons, but that should not happen. Okay, because uh, that's part of the course outline. Okay, uh, and you should have a good understanding of how enzyme names work. So you should already know by now, because this has been discussed to you way before, that if an enzyme ends in kinase, that this is what it means. If it ends with phosphorylase, or if it ends with lipase, or if it ends with reductase, then you should have an idea of what reactions are going on. And you have read the finer details. I will not intend to discuss everything in full detail because that is not my job. Okay? Well, that is my job for the sections I handle. But this is going to be a review. And one more, if I do discuss the finer details here, it will take me like several hours to finish this. So that's not the point of this recording. If you're here to know the finer details, don't forget you're supposed to have your book and your slides. But if you just want the uh, a general overview, the crude idea of how these work, okay, just as a summary of everything to integra integrate everything, this is the uh, thing you should watch. Okay, uh, enough of that. Let's go straight to the first pathway, uh, and this time when we're not going to talk about glycolysis and gluconeogenesis separately anymore. Um, usually, our style is supposed to be we discuss the glycolysis first, but um, this time we're going to discuss it alongside gluconeogenesis because the assumption is you have already discussed this in your classes already. And the idea here is that these two pathways are uh, opposites of each other, at least in terms of the direction. Okay, that glucose, if it becomes pyruvate as a final product, that is called glycolysis. But if you have pyruvate going back to, 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 to glucose, then that is gluconeogenesis. Now, those two pathways are not exactly the same because first, that you probably the first major concept I want you to remember about these two pathways is one, there are some irreversible steps in glycolysis and if you want to remember the steps of those, which I really ask you to memorize because there are just few, there are three here. Step one of glycolysis is irreversible, the one catalyzed by hexokinase. Step three, catalyzed by PFK, is also irreversible. And the next one is the one catalyzed by pyruvate kinase. So those are steps one, three, and ten. And as you notice, in order for us to perform gluconeogenesis, or in other words, in order to reverse what is irreversible, we need other enzymes. So specifically, those are, well, if you start from the bottom, from pyruvate to go back to phosphoenolpyruvate or PEP, you need two enzymes. First is pyruvate carboxylase to convert pyruvate to oxaloacetate. And then next, using PEP carboxykinase to go back to PEP. So it's like saying the, the direction of pyruvate kinase is reversed by these two enzymes. 
And um, now, remember that the reason, one of the interesting things uh, why oxaloacetate is in this pathway is that remember that oxaloacetate is part of the Krebs cycle, and that means that uh, if ever your body is in dire need, it can utilize amino acids, no? uh, and this is like if you're starving already for one day or two, and use your proteins to also make glucose by going through oxaloacetate, then go to PEP, and then going all the way back to glucose. Then after that, don't forget those are just two steps. Okay, we need one. Uh, we need two more to reverse step three. We need the enzyme fructose one six bisphosphatase. And I always I always tell my classes this is supposed to be easy because if you memorize these intermediates of glycolysis, all you have to do is add ACE. So in order to convert fructose one six bisphosphate to fructose six phosphate, then you need the enzyme fructose one six bisphosphatase as well as the last irreversible step. So if you want to, to convert glucose 6-phosphate to glucose, then the name of the enzyme is glucose 6-phosphatase. Now, uh, this is a fine detail, but I think this is worthy of mentioning. Uh, take note that glucose 6-phosphatase is only found in the liver. That's why you should remember, you should have studied something like this, that gluconeogenesis is only predominantly taking place in your liver because it's the only part of your body which has majority of this enzyme, okay? Now, why did I say that? Because, for example, if you have your muscle and then it goes into the anaerobic state, and I'm already assuming you know what happens, from glucose, it goes to pyruvate, and since it's anaerobic, pyruvate will become lactate. And we want to convert lactate to glucose, however, if you want to convert anything back to glucose, you need this enzyme. That's why, in order to convert lactate back to glucose, you must send this first to the liver, and then that's the time that it can go back to pyruvate, then back to glucose. Is this familiar to you? You should be familiar with this, because the name of this cycle, okay, is the Cori cycle. So this is basically how lactate is gluconeogenesized. There's no, there's no word like that. But this is the way that lactate is converted back to glucose via gluconeogenesis in a cyclic fashion. Okay. Now also take note that um, we also have glycerol, which we can uh, also convert to glucose by converting first glycerol to dihydroxyacetone phosphate and then going back up to glucose. Now, also, as far as glycolysis is concerned, when we go from top to bottom, meaning glucose to pyruvate, you should also be mindful of the processes that generate and use ATP. Remember that in your discussion, you, have, you should have discussed that the first five steps, one, two, three, four, five, are called the energy uh, investment steps because here you invest or that means you use up ATP. So if you're going to compute ATP, this step one used one, so that is a loss of one ATP, and this also used another ATP. So that is investment. And then when you do get to the next five steps, which is the energy payoff phase, this five steps, one, two, three, four, five, you now produce ATP. Also, note that since in glycolysis, I need to zoom this a little bit, in glycolysis, G3P, okay, is the only functional substrate and therefore DHAP is also supposed to become G3P okay you, you should already know that starting from G3P everything here from the energy investment phase is going to be multiplied by it's kind of at the edge so I can present so everything would be multiplied by 2 okay so it's kind of cut but uh, yeah I think that's would that's better. So, yeah. So that means if you produce here, or if I wrote here, NAD to NADH, this th this means two molecules of NADH are produced. If this writes here, ATP, that means two of ATP are produced, as well as, as well as, sorry, kind of, what's going on? Uh, as well as this ATP here. So that means that you don't just produce one NADH, that's two, also two for ATP, as well as 2 for ATP. And don't forget for pyruvate, that is also times 2. I didn't write 2 anymore and everything else, but this should be times 2, times 2, times 2. So that means that in this step alone, you already produce 2 ATP as well as this. 
That means that's a total of plus 4 ATP. And don't forget, a while ago, we had two minus ones. So that means that if we're going to compute for the net ATP, that would be positive 4 plus minus 2. And that means that your overall ATP yield for every glucose undergoing glycolysis is two molecules of ATP. That is still separate from the NADH that we know later will be converted to ATP. Okay? All right. So those are the essentials. And uh, notice I'm not anymore discussing the uh, regulation part. The insulin, this has happened in the feather, the fasted state, because I think those are the finer details that uh, you can uh, study on your own. Okay. But uh, the general sense of, of the fed or fasted insulin glucagon scenario is that uh, you should know that if you interpret the word glycolysis, it means breakdown of sugar. So your body is supposed to break down sugar if there is excess, right? Because it, it's useless to break it down if you already have little. That will make your situation worse. So that means that by thinking about it, or if, if it's up to you if you want to memorize it, glycolysis will happen in the fed state. Or gluconeogenesis is going to activate only when you have low glucose levels as, as a way of your body to compensate. For example, you haven't eaten for like a day already, then that's the only time your body will activate gluconeogenesis. So it's always balance of blood sugar as far as carb metabolism is concerned. So I think that's all I will mention about these two pathways here. The other finer details that I may have skipped, it's up to you. But I do suggest you really... You really, really know these steps like 1. Exokinase, so this is a phosphorylation reaction. Step 2 is an isomerization reaction. Or, for example, this is step 3. This is the, remember, this is the rate-limiting step of glycolysis, the most important step. And then in, in step 4, the molecule fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is split into two things. This is a 6-carbon compound being split into 3-carbon compounds, so on and so forth. And I will leave the rest to you. That's what I meant when I said you should be familiar with the names of your enzymes and how they work. Okay. Also remember that as we proceed forward, every time that you have an enzyme with a dehydrogenase, there's usually the involvement of NAD or FAD, or their reduced forms, NADH or FADH. Now, when we do produce pyruvate, so we move forward, your pyruvate can have many fates. So I already mentioned that if your glucose can become pyruvate, then if your body needs it, your pyruvate can go back to glucose via gluconeogenesis. Later on, in the last part of our discussion, there's this thing called transamination wherein pyruvate can become the amino acid alanine, and it has something to do with how your body uh, uh, takes care of your nitrogen balance. Okay, But usually when we discuss the fates of pyruvate as a standalone topic in class, you should remember there are three main fates of pyruvate. For, first, for humans in the aerobic state, so this is the aerobic state, your pyruvate will become acetyl coa, okay? And that is uh, aided by the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, or you can just call it pyruvate dehydrogenase, and that yields one molecule of NAD, and as well as the removal of one CO2. So now, although sometimes the names, the number of carbons, like, you know, I mentioned a while ago, C3, is a fine detail, it's important also because, for example, if pyruvate is a three, C3 compound or a car three carbon compound, if you remove carbon dioxide, that means you take away one carbon from this. That means that acetyl CoA will only have two carbons. And that should make sense because if you're familiar with the acetyl group, when you were naming it before or like looking at drug structures, acetyl groups really do have only two carbons. Okay? Next, if your body is in the anaerobic, I'll just write an, anaerobic state, your pyruvate will be converted by lactate dehydrogenase to lactate. And this time, it's kind of opposite. NADH will become NAD, as opposed to the other pathway or the other direction, NAD becomes NADH. The trick here is that, well, actually, if you just want to get through this part of the pathways, uh, you can just memorize that the lactate and ethanol production are the only two pathways that, or processes that convert NADH to NAD and not the other way around. But if you want something a little more logical or something that will last more in your memory, uh, if ever you have a dehydrogenase that is named after the substrate, for example, pyruvate dehydrogenase is named after pyruvate, the starting material, then NAD will become NADH. But if you have something that's named after the product, in this case, lactate dehydrogenase is named after the product, then NADH will become NAD. So if you look at this, alcohol dehydrogenase is named after the product, which is an alcohol, ethanol. And just like lactate dehydrogenase, NADH will become NAD.
Also note that the conversion of pyruvate to ethanol, or what you call ethanol fermentation, will also involve the decarboxylation of pyruvate. So it, there goes the prefix acid again, which usually means two carbons, because pyruvate decarboxylase, from its name, decarboxylase removed a carbon dioxide molecule. Okay, so pyruvate is converted to acetaldehyde first, and then acetaldehyde is converted on finally to ethanol. And do note that this only happens in some microorganisms, most popularly yeast. For humans, what we produce is lactate. And do remember that it is possible for us to convert lactate back to pyruvate because there is such thing, remember, that we call as the Cori cycle. Alright? So I think that's as far as fate of pyruvate goes. Now we go to glycogen metabolism. So of course, glycogenesis means the creation of glycogen. Glycogenolysis is the breakdown of glycogen. So, uh, we do know that from glycolysis, the first reaction is glucose will become G6P. Alright? And um, although G6P can become pyruvate, that's what we know a while ago about glycolysis, it can also be used for the synthesis of glycogen. Remember that the common sense about your body operating here is that your body will only create glycogen, okay? There will only be glycogen synthesis or glycogenesis if there is excess carbohydrates. And it should make sense because, for example, you ate something high-carb in nature, like a bunch of cups of rice, and uh, your body only needs like a few cups uh, for your energy to be replenished at the moment. Then if you have excess carbohydrates, you don't need that anymore. But of course, you know, it's already in your body, so you have to store it somewhere and you actually store it as glycogen. Or for example, you're already starving and your blood sugar falls down and your body cannot allow that to happen, then it's time to get rid of glycogen, the one that you store, and use it to maintain your body. So it's really more of body sense, like, can I really understand how this happens? Does it make sense if my body does this when I'm fed or fasted? Once again, hopefully this will help you think about uh, these pathways in a more humanistic nature, uh, kind of more related to you, because this is really what our body does anyway. Anyway, let's go to the pathway. So usually, in order to bridge glucose and glycogen, we need to go through the intermediate G1P, or glucose 1-phosphate, and G6P is converted to G1P using a phosphoglucomutase enzyme. Also, um, now I think it's a chance to remind you or to show you that every time you have a mutase enzyme, it only converts positional isomers, meaning positions of the substituents. So here, the phosphate was at 6, now this is at 1. So it's only the position that changes. And you should also have noticed that in glycolysis, where is that? In glycolysis, if you have phosphoglycerol mutase, then the number 3 just becomes number 2 or back. Okay? So that's the, the sense of the mutase suffix. And uh, if, you, if you want to create, so this is color-coded in blue, if you want to create glycogen, you follow this downward direction. So the next step you do is to convert G1P to UDP glucose by adding UTP. And then you add UDP glucose to these molecules of uh, glycogen. So let's say that N is a large number, let's say 1,000. And uh, by adding UDP glucose, what happens is that the UDP goes away. The glucose molecule sticks itself to the 1,000 glucose molecules. And what happens is you add one of that. If this is the original number, this is the plus one. So for example, if this was 1,000 molecules of glucose, by one round of glycogen synthase making an alpha-1 for glycosidic bond, then now the number becomes 1,000. Then one more round, it becomes 1,002, 1,003, and so forth, so on and so forth. If ever you need to add to alpha-1,6 bonds, which we know is responsible for the branching of glycogen, then of course you need to use the enzyme branching enzyme. And that allows you to create your glycogen, or that allows you to elongate or make your glycogen stores larger. Now, when you are already in the fasted state, again, and you need to break this down into glucose molecules, the glycogenolytic pathway happens, so color red, and uh, phosphorylase will take away an alpha-1 for a glycosidic bond so that your original glycogen, uh, glucose count will be minus 1. So if this is 1,000, then this will be 999, or so on. Or if ever you need to remove the alpha-1,6 bonds, take it away from the glycogen molecule, then you just need the 
word or the sorry the enzyme the branching enzyme and the words are so easy to remember because adding one six means to branch to remove one six means to the branch so that is the easy part of this pathway and then uh, if you notice there's this minus one glucose that minus one glucose that we talked about a while ago is now released as glucose one phosphate which can now be converted by the mutase back to g6p and then remember in the liver G6 phosphatase, glucose 6 phosphatase will convert this to glucose. So glycogenolysis apparently is, since it depends on this enzyme also, which I noted already earlier in this pathway that, that this enzyme is in the liver, it looks like the complete process of glycogenolysis will only happen primarily in the liver as well. Okay, So it's, it's just back and forth, really, for glycogen metabolism. Next. In the pentose phosphate pathway, remember that there are two phases. Okay? The one above here is called the oxidation phase, okay? wherein your starting material is glucose 6 phosphate once again. Okay? And uh, it's converted in one, two, three steps to ribulose 5 phosphate. Do note that in these three steps, the first step is the most important because it is the rate limiting step, and that is catalyzed by G6PD. Or if you remember what this means, it's glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, wherein there is the production of NADPH. And when you discuss it in class, you should remember that NADPH serves as an antioxidant. Uh, specifically, one of its common roles is to assist the molecule, and I will not discuss this anymore because it's a fine detail, uh, NADPH will assist glutathione in uh, uh, dealing with what you call as oxidative stress. So, again, be careful because NADPH is really much different from NADH as I, have, as I have told repetitively in my classes. Now, also take note that the final product, at least in the oxid, sorry, well, oxidation or oxidative phase, is that you produce ribulose 5-phosphate, but it's not ribose yet. Ribulose is the isomer of ribose, and in order for ribulose to become ribose 5-phosphate, it has to undergo isomerization. And uh, on top of that, ribulose 5-phosphate can also be converted to X5P. This is uh, well better XU5P because X is silose. This is supposed to be cellulose 5-phosphate. And uh, going downward, the these interconversions of sugars is called the non-oxidative phase. Now, uh, as I always tell my classes, don't forget that in order to remember the pairings, okay, uh, just in case you want to remember them, uh, all you need to do is to remember that if you add these, you should get the same number of carbons. So for example, if I have XU5P and R5P, and both of them have 5 carbons as reflected by the position of their phosphate, the total number of carbons of these two should be 10. So that if you interconvert them into other products like G3P and S7P, the overall sum is also 10. So 5 plus 5 is 10. 3 plus 7 is 10. Then play around with those sugars again. You get 4 plus 6 is 10. Now, if you do have E4P, in the human body, we don't really have much to use with for E4P or erythrose for phosphate. So usually what happens is that E4P will react with another molecule of cellulose. Again, this is supposed to be XU5P. So remember, the carbons are uh, 5 plus 4. This time, it's 9. So when they interconvert, you get 3 plus 6, which is also 9. And remember that fructose 6-phosphate, as well as glycerol free phosphates, you have already seen them before in glycolysis. And therefore, if ever your body creates them, they can go to glycolysis. But remember that the purpose of the non-oxidative phase is really, uh, despite the chaos that's happening here, it's really, as you can see, it's boxed already to create ribose 5-phosphate. And the reason why we need ribose 5-phosphate, remember, we have phosphate, and you have the 5-carbon sugar ribose. All you need is a base, and therefore, we remember that we need R5P for nucleotide synthesis. Or, well, if you want to go fast forward, you, you want to talk about DNA or RNA synthesis. So remember, in the second shifting, we discussed that you need nucleotides to create your RNA and DNA. But that will not happen if you don't have the sugar in the phosphate, which you can actually get from this non-oxidative phase of the pathway, the R5P or ribose 5-phosphate. So that's as far as the pentose phosphate pathway will be discussed, and we move forward.
Next, we have the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. And then we will combine it with the electron transport chain. Simply because these two are very uh, linked, very much linked together. As well as the fact that both Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain take place in the mitochondria. Specifically, the, 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 the Krebs cycle happens in the matrix and the electron transport chain is in the inner membrane. And if you remember the anatomy of the mitochondrion, if this is the this is the outer membrane, and then let's say that you know this is the inner membrane, the inner portion is called the matrix. So literally, the Krebs cycle happens here, and the in, uh, electron transport chain happens here. So they're literally beside each other. Okay, so that's uh, that's what you should imagine. And so, example, imagine that in the matrix you have a molecule of acetylcholine, two carbons. You combine it with oxaloacetate for carbons using citrate synthase to perform, or sorry, to, to create citrate, which is a six carbon compound. And then, you know, just to generalize this pathway, the general idea is if you have the two carbons of acetylcholine entering the Krebs cycle, later on you will notice that, for example, in the conversion of isocytate to alpha ketoglutarate, there's the removal of carbon dioxide. That actually, you can think of it as a carbon molecule or a carbon atom of acetylcholine. And then furthermore, once you have the 5-carbon alpha-ketoglutarate, it's converted to succinylcholine. There's also the release of another carbon dioxide, which you can now think of as the second carbon of acetylcholine. And that means that really the goal of the Krebs cycle is to convert the two carbons of acetylcholine to two molecules of carbon dioxide. And remember, uh, and note that once you do that, your four carbons initially, which is oxaloacetate, now becomes succinylcholine, which is uh, also a four-carbon compound. That means this is the reason why uh, this is a cycle. You start with four carbons, it becomes six, but later on it goes back to four. So the cycle will repeat because of that. Now also, take note that the reason for the Krebs cycle, at least as far as energy is concerned, is to create energy via production of NADH and FADH. And actually, I forgot here that in the conversion of succinylcholine to succinate, there's the production of a molecule of GTP. Okay? And uh, the shortcut here is to remember that all enzymes that produce NADH and uh, FADH end in dehydrogenase. Because I already mentioned that before. Usually, if, I have, a, if you have a dehydrogenase enzyme, it will convert uh, FADH or NADH. Uh, sorry, or NAD, NAD or FAD to NADH or FADH, okay? Alright, and uh, once you do produce the these cofactors like NADH and FADH, remember, imagine this is happening in the mitochondrion, in the matrix. These can now float, so you can imagine, uh, you can imagine these molecules of FAD and NAD will now go through our electron transport chain. So imagine this is the matrix and these molecules float to the inner membrane. And uh, the electron transport chain will now use NAD or FAD for what we call as oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative or oxidative phosphorylation. Meaning that there will be phosphorylation, in other words, creation of ATP, like what you're seeing here, by the process of oxidation. And remember that in your uh, basics of organic chemistry or even general chemistry, uh, if a molecule loses a hydrogen, that's called oxidation. So if NADH becomes NAD, that's oxidation. If FADH becomes FAD, that's oxidation. Because that oxidation will produce electrons that will jump from complex 1 to complex 2 to 3 to 4. And then by doing that, they release protons or H plus ions that exit the matrix. Remember, this was remember everything here was happening in the matrix. And now the protons in the matrix go out to the intermembrane space. And then the the rationale for this is the protons that exit the intermembrane space will now go back to ATP synthase or complex 5. And those protons will cause ATP synthase or complex 5 to finally create your ATP molecules. Okay? So that is the entire role, uh, the reason why we create ATP from NADH. That once again, by oxidizing NADH, then we get protons out, which when they go back to complex 5, creates ATP. That is how we realize that NADH and FADH are equivalent to ATP molecules. In fact, NADH is 2.5 and FADH is 1.5 respectively. So that's the general idea of these two uh, parts of cell respiration. Okay? So we now proceed further. And uh, this is now fat 
okay, or lipid metabolism. So, first, fatty acid synthesis. Remember that this happens during your fed state. Okay? I will not anymore be able to discuss the details of the regulation, but basically, long story short, if you've eaten too much carbohydrates, or basically if you've eaten too much, okay, um, assuming you do have like something like rice or, or bread in your food, then there will be acetyl-CoA molecules that will, instead of going to the Krebs cycle, will go to the synthesis of malonyl-CoA, which now... You can uh, add malonyl-CoA to an acyl-CoA. Usually, your first acyl-CoA is acetyl-CoA. And uh, what happens is a repetitive cycle of condensation, reduction, dehydration, and reduction. So, remember that malonyl-CoA is the building block for fat synthesis, meaning you, you add malonyl-CoA multiple times in order to continuously add two carbons to your uh, elongating fatty acid. Like, for example, if you start with acetyl-CoA, that's two carbons, and malonyl-CoA is going to add two more carbons, that means adding these for the first time will get you four. Add another malonyl-CoA, you get six, and then eight, and then ten, and then twelve. So that's what's happening al almost every time. And uh, that means that this is critical for fat synthesis. That's why, remember, that acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA, or the carboxylation of acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA, is the rate limiting step. If you stop this, then you can somehow um, uh, slow down your body's fatty acid synthesis. Well, anyway, after repetitive cycles, usually the carbons that your the carbon number in your fatty acid that cons is considered as final is 16 carbons. So that's palmitic. So once you do have your final acyl CoA, your body can uh, get it out as a free fatty acid. So if the name of this one is, you know, palmitoyl coa because it's palmitic acid with coa, by getting coa out, you get the free fatty acid palmitic acid. So that's actually as far as the synthesis goes. Now, if we do want to break down our palmitic acid because you are already in the fed state, okay, remember during the fed state, your blood sugar goes down, and then there may be a time that your body will now start shifting from using sugars to lipids, specifically your fats, as your primary energy source. In that case, the free fatty acid will be reunited with COA, so it goes back to acyl-CoA, and from, and uh, I, I haven't written here, no. uh, although I haven't mentioned it, remember that all of these things happen in the cytosol. So once, for example, you are in the fed state, you have this acyl-CoA in the cytosol, the next step is that this acyl-CoA will enter the outer membrane of the mitochondrion. So this barrier is like the mitochondrion, okay? And um, in the intermembrane space, your acyl-CoA is converted to acyl-carnitine, meaning your CoA temporarily goes out and a molecule in the mitochondrion called the carnitine will bind instead. So now we have acyl-carnitine, as you see. And carnitine's role is to deliver this acyl or this fatty acid from the intermembrane space down to the matrix because beta oxidation or fatty oxi uh, acid oxidation or basically the breakdown of fatty acids happens inside the mitochondrial matrix okay and uh, by the time that this enters the matrix the carnitine molecule will go away then coa will come back in giving us again our acyl coa in this case for example if this was palmitic again this is palmitoyl coa and now this will go through repetitive cycles of oxidation, hydration, oxidation, and cleavage. And that every time that these four steps happen, you go back to your acyl-CoA, but this time minus two carbons, which is, which is pretty much the opposite of fatty acid synthesis. Okay, because in fatty acid synthesis, it's plus two. Here, it's minus two. And just like a while ago, you repeat this again and again. In beta oxidation, you repeat this minus two again and again. So if a while ago, if you have... 2, it becomes 4, and then 6, 8, 10, 12. Here, it becomes 16, 14, um, 12, 10, 8, and so on. So they're like complete opposites. Not only that, they, uh, but also the reactions, they're complete opposites. Look, the first step in beta oxidation is oxidation. The last step in fatty acid synthesis is reduction. Then after oxidation in beta oxidation, you have hydration. In fatty acid synthesis, you have dehydration and then oxidation, and then opposite is reduction, then cleavage, which means to cut into two parts, 
here we have conden condensation which is to combine so they're really 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 opposites of each other and uh, remember that in every time you have uh, these four steps happen you produce fad H and NAD H which can now go also to the ADC also the two carbons that you remove from this series of steps in beta oxidation that two carbons uh, those two carbons will be actually a molecule of acetylcoba which we know, if it goes through the Krebs cycle, will also produce NADH and FADH, which will, again, go to the ATC. And remember that we will not anymore practice this here, but you should know how to compute the ATP of beta oxidation, or, or from the beta oxidation of a certain fatty acid. Not really the, like the most critical part of your final exams, but you should at least know how to compute it because uh, it's commonly studied by undergrad students. Next, uh, we will discuss uh, two pathways, and these pathways are related because of the presence of HMG-CoA, okay? which uh, if you studied this somewhere before, it means hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA. So if you are in the fed state, okay, in your cytosol, HMG-CoA is converted to mevalonate, and this is why the pathway that starts from mevalonate is the mevalonate pathway, which um, can go through several steps. I will not read them anymore, uh, but the, the clue is like all of them have PP or pyrophosphate. So the series of pyrophosphates, fast forward, will become squalene, which is a 30-carbon compound, which after, well, as the books mention it, 20 plus steps will finally yield as sterols like cholesterol. So that means that, long story short, HMG-CoA is actually, or, or the mevalonate pathway is actually the pathway for the synthesis of sterols. That's why, if you remember, the enzyme that converts HMG-CoA to mevalonate is HMG-CoA reductase, which is, uh, if you study your drugs, uh, this is the enzyme inhibited by statins. That's why when statins inhibit the rate-limiting enzyme, then your cholesterol levels will go down. Now, also, note that the multiple of carbons in all the pyrophosphates here are, is, you know, are more multiples of 5. So, like, 5 carbons, 5 carbons, if you add it, they become 10. And then you add 5 more carbons from IPP, it becomes 15. You add 5 more carbons, it becomes 20. And the reason why this is important is because when you discuss more of these next term, then uh, you will be reminded that 10 carbons, this molecule, geranil, will uh, be the starting material for monoterpenes or, or for example geranil geranil is 20 carbons it will be the starting material for the diterpenes so on and so forth but that's not really our focus um, for this subject also if you are so that is during the fed state so that's the mevalonate pathway that's during the fed state if you are in the fasted state and uh, by this i mean extended periods of fasting then what happens this time is ketogenesis. And this time, the enzyme that will be activated is HMG-CoA lyase. So do not confuse lyase with reductase. Okay? HMG-CoA reductase is for the mevalonate pathway. HMG-CoA lyase is for uh, the ketogenetic pathway, wherein you produce your three ketone bodies, acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And uh, the other details of ketogenesis are too fine for me to discuss here but the basic idea is that when you are fasted your brain needs something uh, other than sugars because the sugar level is low and fats because your brain cannot mobilize or utilize fats for metabolism so the ketones that you see here these uh, three are now the main energy sources of the brain during the fasting state and uh, hopefully you've uh, discussed some you know interesting things like uh, ketogenic diets ketoacidosis and, uh, and more during your class. Also take note that the reason why cholesterol is important is because it will give rise to a lot of important derivatives like hormones, vitamin D, or bile acids. Okay? Then uh, actually in this uh, review, I will not anymore discuss the pyrimidine and purine synthesis because there's too little detail for, the, uh, for, for me to cover. But uh, basically when you do, maybe I'll just write this down, Basically, when you do make your nucleotides, like the pyrimidines or purines, there are two major pathways. The one wherein you start from really small bits of carbons and nitrogens and so on is the de novo pathway, okay, which literally means from scratch. 
and uh, if you want to recycle ready-made nucleotides, which you know they're already synthesized, okay, you just need to use them again. Then you call that as salvage. Also, hopefully you remember the bit that the the, the detail that if you do have purines, their final waste product is uric acid. And you're supposed to be familiar with this because sometime before you should have discussed uric acid as the reason why gout actually becomes uh, a sort of disease for humans. Okay, but again, uh, that's all I will say for those. You should uh, refer to your book, or or actually, there's no nucleotide synthesis in the book. You should refer to our slides for additional detail. Now we finally go to nitrogen metabolism, and when we say nitrogen metabolism, we're actually referring to proteins. Simply because if you remember. Uh, carbohydrates, CHO, are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen primarily. Um, lipids are also CHO. Of course, there, there are some exceptions. There are some proteins, with, I sorry, there are some carbohydrates with, with uh, nitrogens. There are some lipids with nitrogens. But primarily, carbs, most carbs and most lipids, especially those that we use for energy, do not have nitrogen. And uh, therefore, the only biomolecules that we can assume that have nitrogen are proteins. That's why, you know, just a little color co correlation. In the hospital, if you have chon in the patient charts, it usually means proteins, okay? Because they are the only ones with nitrogen. Anyway, um, the idea here is that your body can store carbs as glycogen. Remember that. I mentioned that a while ago. Your body can store lipid as fats or as adipose or adipocytes, but your body cannot actually store excess proteins. If, for example, you took a high-protein diet, you like ate a lot of chicken today or what, okay, only wings, something like that, um, the proteins from the chicken uh, fibers will not actually be utilized by your body unless you, your body uh, actually fa has a reason for doing that. Like, for example, if you work out, okay, and your, your muscles need some uh, replenishment, then the amino acids from your proteins... Um, in food will do that. But if, for example, you just ate a lot of protein but you didn't really work out, then most of that is going straight into your urine. I'm talking about the nitrogen of the proteins in the food that you just ate. Now, of course, we know that the first step is that uh, your body must be able to break down proteins into the individual amino acids. So you can imagine your amino acids, you, know, you break it down in your intestines, and uh, they now go to your blood and distribute to uh, tissues and muscles. Now, your body realizes, hey, there's too much uh, nitrogen here, and I cannot store it. Let me get it out. So, in most tissues, what happens is that if, for example, this is the amino acid from the diet or from the food you just took, the first step is called transamination. What happens is that an amino acid will exchange its amino group with glutamate, specifically, um, oh, wait, sorry, um, well, and the amino acid will give its amino group to glutamate, and when that happens, glutamate becomes glutamine. Also note my color code here, color blue. Anything here which is color blue will reflect where the nitrogen is. So for example, in most tissues, you have your amino acids there, that's the amino group, that's the nitrogen. And uh, the first step is transamination, wherein the amino acid gives its amino group to glutamine. Uh, I mean to glutamate, so that glutamate becomes glutamine. Now, the amino acid will become a keto acid, and we will kind of ignore this for, for the moment because uh, all we care about is the color blue, you know, the nitrogen. So the nitrogen from the amino acid goes to glutamate, now we have glutamine. And then finally, um, glutamine goes to your liver. Okay, uh, Let me continue this later. Because there's also another scenario. If you, if you have specifically your muscle cells, um, specifically, uh, instead of glutamate, the molecule which will take the amino uh, group from the amino acid is pyruvate. So transamination is also the process. So the amino acid gives its amino group, so its nitrogen, to pyruvate, so that pyruvate will become alanine. So the amino acid's nitrogen is now with alanine, and this alanine is the one which will go to your liver. And again, we ignore this already. We care about the nitrogens for now. Now in the liver, so you have already glutamine, you already have alanine. For glutamine, it's a little more straightforward. In glutamine, what happens is that it's deaminated, meaning an amine group is removed. And actually, what happens is that glutamine goes back to glutamate. That should make sense because when glutamate received an amino group, and when it received a nitrogen, it became glutamate. So therefore, if glutamine will remove a nitrogen, it will go back to glutamate. 
and when you deaminate, then you release a molecule of ammonia. So glutamate will now go back to the other parts of your body, okay? And uh, our nitrogen is now NH3. Now for alanine, it's a little more complicated. Uh, in your liver, alanine is further transaminated. So the amino group of alanine is now given to alpha-ketoglutarate. So alpha-ketoglutarate becomes glutamate in the liver, okay? And uh, alanine, therefore, its nitrogen will now be transferred and will become glutamate. And next, when glutamate is already here in the liver, glutamate can be further converted back to alpha-ketoglutarate, but this time, it's the amination. So it, uh, the amino group of glutamate will not be given to something else, but instead, it will just be outright removed. So when glutamate removes its nitrogen, goes back to alpha-ketoglutarate, the amine or the nitrogen will now be also released as ammonia. So basically, guys, the idea is, uh, regardless of where your amino acids are initially, all roads lead to the removal of ammonia. However, if you've discussed this in your class, remember that this is a toxic molecule, and therefore, there should be something that your body will do to convert this to something else. And that is specifically, the ammonia will combine with the carbon dioxide molecule and the phosphate. It will give rise to carbamol phosphate. Notice I've written this in blue, so you can assume the nitrogen is with carbamol phosphate. And carbamol phosphate will combine with ornithine. That is the first step of the so-called urea cycle. The reason why you call this urea cycle is because at the end of the cycle, you should be able to generate urea, which is basically, urea is basically the final waste product for proteins. Okay, so just to read everything that's going on here. So carbamyl phosphate will combine with ornithine to give us citrulline. So at the moment, color blue, it's it's the one bearing the nitrogen. And then add an aspartate, it will become arginine succinate, which is now the one which bears the nitrogen. Next, remove the succinate, it will be removed as fumarate instead. Then you get the amino acid arginine. So arginine, currently color blue, has the nitrogen. And in order to complete the cycle, in order to go back to ornithine, notice ornithine is written in black. Yeah, that's because ornithine does not anymore have the nitrogen. Because one more time, arginine will be deaminated. Well, not really deaminated, but specifically, a part of it will be cleaved off or removed. And that is actually going to be removed as urea. And therefore, the basic idea is your proteins, especially excess proteins in your food, will be transferred first to the liver as either glutamine or alanine and then they will all meet to ammonia and because your body needs to convert this toxic ammonia to something else this will have to go through the urea cycle in your liver in order to finally get the final waste product urea and then you can assume that urea from the liver will be directed to the kidney and it will go out as urine because urea urine you can get the words from there the idea Urea is the major waste product that is detected in urine, okay? So, that's basically the idea of nitrogen um, disposal, okay? Or metabolism. So, from amino acids, series of transaminations, deaminated to ammonia, then urea cycle, out to urea. So, that is the overall discussion of the pathways that we have discussed in 6112. And I hope that in some way this helps uh, some of you guys. Good luck for the finals. This is your last stand. And before I completely finish things, I just thought I remember I made a drawing of an integrated map of the pathways we discussed in this subject. And uh, I'm going to upload this probably. I'll send you a link to it. This is a big photo actually. So if you zoom in, you can really see the details and probably my pencil marks there that did not get erased. And anyway, um, what I want to say here is that if ever you want to really get the complete picture, then I drew this one. I have never drawn something this nice in my entire life, so maybe you'd like to see it also. And uh, the point of drawing all of this is really not to intimidate, although, well, we have no choice but to be intimidated by it probably. Um, but this is nice if you studied the individual pathways because remember that at the end of the day, these pathways are never really separate from one another. Like, uh, for example, uh, we clearly see here that in glycolysis, there's a lot going on with G6P. 
So although G6P can go to pyruvate, G6P can also be used for the synthesis of glycogen. You can also use this to create NADPH and the pentose phosphate pathway, which is because um, which is nice because when you look at the molecule G6P in our discussion a while ago, it's written in many different ways. It's part of glycogen, it's part of the pentose phosphate pathway, but when you see this, you will now see a more complete picture of where G6P really lies. And that's what's nice about this one. Or, I don't know, probably, uh, for example, if we have a ribose 5-phosphate, I mentioned that ribose 5-phosphate is essential for nucleotide synthesis, so that's R5P. We did the, I did write here that you can use R5P for de novo synthesis of the purines and pyrimidines, right? Or, or probably, um, if you have acetyl-CoA, and really honestly, pyruvate and acetyl-CoA are like the busiest molecules ever, because pyruvate has many fates, can become ethanol, can become lactate, you can convert pyruvate back to oxaloacetate to go back to PEP, and then to gluconeogenesis it will go, or acetyl-CoA, you can enter the Krebs, right? You can you can just you know you can just look at it. You can see acetylcholine in the Krebs cycle. You can also see acetylcholine in the synthesis of fats, and you can even see acetylcholine in the synthesis of sterols. And uh, although we discussed them separately a while ago, you can now see here that you know it makes this molecule really really central also, because you can use acetylcholine again for the methylenate pathway. You can convert it to malinolacoa to create, uh, create fatty acids, or you can just simply feed it to the citric acid cycle. Okay, or for example, the fact that the Krebs cycle and the urease cycle are related, it shows here that uh, alpha ketoglutarate is related to, you know, to deamination, right, wherein the ammonia can enter the urease cycle. So sometimes, you know, you can even find it that. Uh, online that some people call these to us the Krebs bicycle because anyway these are both cycles that he discovered and they are somewhat related to to one another so what else or for example the way I drew it a while ago the the fatty acid synthesis and breakdown I drew it in a linear fashion but uh, here I drew it in a, a circular fashion because anyway uh, I did mention that it's like now it's hanging okay, come on yeah that it's repeating both the synthesis and the and the breakdown so I just converted them to cycles anyway most books write it also that way and uh, the fact that in both uh, it's acting up uh, and the fact that in both the Krebs cycle and in beta oxidation you create you create NADH um, what's also interesting is that uh, remember, beta oxidation happens in the matrix. The Krebs cycle also happens in the matrix. And since both of them also produce NADH, right? Krebs cycle produces NADH. Beta oxidation produces NADH as well as FADH for both. They can both go to the electron transport chain. So here, I wrote it as just the letters ETC. Here, connected the Krebs cycle to the Krebs cycle, I wrote it as the actual diagram. But now you can see clearly that uh, if I show you, right? citric acid cycle and beta oxidation, they both have NADH, which can both go to the electron transfer chain, specifically NADH at complex 1 and FADH at complex 2. So, you know, I'm not really promoting this or something. I'm not getting anything from this, but um, I think it's quite cute to study if you can understand all the pathways. And uh, it will result to something like this. And this is essentially your body in a nutshell. Imagine that. Your body deals with proteins, nucleic acids, you know, carbohydrates, and lipids in a way that is intimidating yet really profound. So I hope that um, at the end of the day you realize that biochemistry is something about you because this is what all of us, human beings, as well as all creatures can perform. So I end with this. This is now really the end and uh, I hope that you really got something from, from our discussion of metabolic pathways.